So, Anthony, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, not a problem. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, could you just kick us off and let everyone know um, a bit about your background, what you study today, what your field is, what your profession is, um, and kind of how you got there? Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm a medical doctor I'm specializing in neurosurgery, so I'm still in my uh, neurosurgical residency. Um, so that's my my day job and my my night job and my weekend job mostly. And then uh, outside of that, I've also had a, an interest in to, in uh, diet and nutrition and how that affects health and chronic disease. Um, it's something that I looked into uh, quite deeply uh, over over twenty years ago. And um, you know, as you know, uh, studying the biological sciences and pre med. And also playing high level rugby, I was always interested in nutrition and how the, how the body works and biochemistry. Um, and um, you know, from from an in intellectual standpoint, but as but as well as a as a, a my own performance uh, standpoint. And so now, as a clinician, I've just seen you know just how much you know food um, makes a difference in people's lives in all the chronic diseases that we see, even you know, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, certainly, you know, all of these things uh, largely stem from, you know, the eating the wrong foods, you know, and it's just a simple biological uh, function of, of our species, you know, we are a species of animal. And, um, you know, all animals have have an optimal biological species specific diet. And if you go outside of that, you, you get harm. And we see that all over the animal kingdom as well. And so that's something that I've noticed. And that's something I've looked uh, a lot in uh, a lot more into. And so even on top of neurosurgery or any inclusive of neurosurgery, I try to incorporate uh, dietary measures to help optimize people's health. I mean, that's, that's a wide and very, um, very topical area at the moment. I mean, mm -hmm. your, your journey from, you mentioned you were high level sport, high level rugby an athlete, and you've, you've gone along this journey and you're a medical doctor now, and you've moved into, I mean, the way that I came across you is specifically around carnival and you're mentioning a species specific diet. So could you talk me a little bit through about how you've come from your sort of athletics journey and your rugby journey and how you've got to the area where you are, which is talking about carnivorism and how that's optimal for, for humans. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it sort of started for me about, you know, again, like 22 years ago when I was taking cancer biology at the University of Washington in Seattle. And we were, you know, learning about all the different, you know, carcinogens, these natural carcinogens that are just in our environment, including in the food we eat and, and specifically in the plants and vegetables that we eat. And, you know, this isn't this really shouldn't come as a shock to anyone, especially anyone who's studied biology or botany, because, you know, this is, this is a fundamental rule of, of plant and fungi kingdoms is that, you know, these are stationary uh, organisms. They can't like run away or fight back like an animal can. So they need to use different defense mechanisms to stop from being eaten and, and preyed upon. You know, all living things have a defense. You know, it's kill or be killed out in, in, in nature. And so if you don't have a defense, you're going to die, you're going to go extinct. And so plants and fungi largely use um, poisons. That's one of their main defenses is by being physically poisonous. And so, you know, we, we all know this intuitively, we, you know, you get lost out in the woods, you can't just eat any random plant, you know, or any random thing, like most of them will kill you or make you very, very sick. So we understand that, that there's this thing called an inedible plant and edible plants, most plants are inedible. The ones that are edible are not necessarily 100% safe. You know, they're just less toxic. They don't kill us right away. And so maybe we can survive on them and that gives us some sort of advantage, but that doesn't mean that they're optimal for us. We were, we were learning all this from a cancer perspective. And so we were looking at carcinogens. And so, you know, we learned day one that, you know, um, that uh, Brussels sprouts had 136 known human carcinogens and that mushrooms had over hundred wow. and that spinach, kale, lettuce, celery, cabbage, cucumber, broccoli, you name it. Every, every single plant that you've ever seen in a store or bought or eaten, you know, we were given lists of them Talking with the, the number of carcinogens and like there wasn't a single one under 60, you know, and we've actually known since the 1980s that they're actually quite abundant. The naturally occurring uh, toxins and carcinogens in plants outweigh the pesticides we spray on them industrially 
by a factor of 10,000, and that the naturally occurring ones are far more likely to cause cancer than the pesticides we spray on them. So the idea of, well, if you, if you grow in your own garden and it's organic, you know, then it's okay. Well, no, actually, it's just a drop in the bucket. The plant itself is worse than the pesticides, and that's why we still have pesticides. You know, people sort of make the the have a misunderstanding. They think that that everything bad on earth has just come from humans, you know, and there's everything we do. It's like, oh, it's just these pesticides and these chemicals. Like, sure, those are not good, but there are more than than one bad thing on earth, and and uh, and plants contain quite a lot of them. Um, so I, I was look, we, we were learning this in cancer biology and, and we were quite blown away by this and, you know, quite, you know, quite a lot of disbelief. And I remember thinking to myself, I was like, but, you know, the vegetables are still good for you though, right? And our professor just looked at us and, you know, he must've just read our minds because he said, you know, he's like, I don't eat salad. I don't eat vegetables. I don't let my kids eat vegetables. Plants are trying to kill you. And I was like, right, screw plants. And I just, I just stopped that day. And, you know, by default, I went on to a carnivore diet without realizing it. I just stopped eating plants altogether. And I was like, well, what the hell? Everything's, everything has plants. All these foods have plants. All these things are mixed with plants or use plants in their ingredients. And so I just ended up getting this, you know, eggs, meat, and milk at the time. I don't drink milk anymore, but at the time I was just like anything that didn't have a plant. And, um, and so that, that's what I did. And so I inadvertently went on to a carnivore diet and this is what, you know, I was playing high level rugby. Um, you know, I had been an all American. I was playing in, you know, the top leagues in America, the top leagues in Canada and, um, and, uh, you know, and, and going to college at the same time. And I, you know, my, my performance just, just hit new heights. I mean, it, it absolutely took off my fitness, my athletic performance just went through the roof. It was just night and day, the difference that it made. And so I, I continued doing that for, you know, you know, five or so years until I was um, uh, living in England. And I just, I didn't have the same access to food. Some of the meat was breaded. And I was like, well, is it, does it make that much of a difference? You know, is it just a little bit, is that going to hurt me? And, and it, it did, it actually made a, a significant difference. And I think the major difference was that it, it, it made me break away from the complete avoidance of plants. And so things started slipping back in and, and sort of before you knew it, um, you know, I was, I was sort of incorporating these things and eating salads again, because, oh, you have to do this. You have to do that. And I was still almost 80%, you know, meat, like that was always what I always wanted to eat, but all these things slipped back in and, and it seriously affected my health and performance as well. I was getting sore again. I was getting little niggling injuries and, um, you know, whereas normally I would never have any of that. So I rediscovered this you know, five, six years ago and, um, and, uh, all of a sudden just, just came to the realization, like, that's what I was doing. I was living as a carnivore and humans are carnivores. That's, I mean, I've learned that since I was a kid, humans are apex predators, top of the food chain. You know, we literally get taught this in school. And then at the same time, we're, we're supposed to believe that we're herbivores. I don't, I don't see how that works. You know, that we, anyway, and, and this is the sort of the vegan pushes that actually, no, 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 no. We evolved as, you know, frugivores or, 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 or herbivores or something like that, which doesn't, which is completely fictitious. You know, it makes no sense biologically or anatomically, certainly not evolutionarily. That goes against, that goes counter all that available evidence. And, you know, but I, I just don't know how you, you could say, you know, a, a top, someone who's top of the food chain is also a frugivore. Like the, the, that doesn't, that's not a thing. And so looking back at that and now saying like, okay, that's what I was doing. I was actually living as a carnivore. I was eating as my, as our species is supposed to eat. And my body was, was working the way it was supposed to. And I was like, that was it. That was the difference. And that's why that's when I started not being as, um, you know, feeling as good when I slipped off of that. And so mm -hmm. immediately dropped all the greens. I was only eating sort of greens and meat at that time and just dropping the greens. It just completely changed everything. I dropped uh, 10 kilos in uh, a week and a half or yeah, yeah, about a week and a half, like 10 and, days. And you think that drop is, was what water weight or like, mostly, just... I think, mean, yeah, mostly yeah. water weight. Yeah. You know, you, you carry a lot of inflammation uh, and, and it wasn't even like glycogen. Like if you're, if you're eating sugar and carbohydrates, you're going to store a lot more glycogen in your muscles. That's going to like suck in water as well. I, I was, I was not eating any carbs at that time anyway. So I was already basically keto. I wasn't doing keto. Yeah. I just wasn't eating carbs. And, 
just dropping the greens. It was just spinach, kale, and broccoli, and then meat. Those, those are the only things I was eating. Yeah. Just by dropping the greens, I lost 10 kilos. And uh, yeah, because you just, you just hold on to a lot of inflammation and water weight because of that. I mean, it's so counter to everything mm. we're told about nutrition. I mean, literally couldn't be more opposite. We're told eat less red meat and eat mm. more greens. And what yeah. you're saying is like, eat only red meat and eat no greens. Like, Absolutely. I mean, yeah. how, how have we got to this stage? I mean, it's something that I've been digging into a little bit more. It's like the whole, almost, I want to say corruption, but I don't want to sound conspiratorial, but like there's this whole wave of, of, I don't know whether you call it big business or certainly an agenda to push us away from meat and towards either vegetables or towards a plant-based diet. I mean, mm. like what's your perspective on how we've got it so wrong? Well, it, it, uh, there certainly has its origins in, in, uh, industry with the sugar companies paying for, uh, research to be put out that was fraudulent, you know, saying to, you know, arguing that, cholesterol caused heart disease and saturated fat contributed to that. Uh, when, when indeed it was uh, actually the, the studies and, and evidence was looking like it was actually the, the increased consumption of, of sugar that was precipitating this rise in, in heart disease, which is very new disease. It really was largely non-existent, um, you know, even in the first half of the 20th century and certainly before that. And there were people coming out saying that like, you know, like, look, here's this study, here's this very strong correlation, you know, in every country that starts increasing their um, uh, refined sugar, uh, you know, uh, consumption, you have, you have this, this rise in heart disease, you know, that corresponds, you know, just sometime after that. And it's, these lines just track up, you know, with a, with a bit of delay in between, uh, as you would expect when you have sort of a, of a delayed sort of, you know, dose dependent, uh, you know, uh, response. And so, you know, we, we actually have, you know, hard data on this. We actually have like internal memos and the internal, uh, uh, you know, communications between the, in the sugar companies back in like the fifties and sixties talking about how there was this research looking at, at uh, sugar as a causative factor for heart disease. And like, well, we gotta, we gotta shut this down. And so they, they detailed how they paid off a number of different professors and researchers across America, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure elsewhere, to put out uh, you know, false data. You know, one was Ansel Keys, who if you listen to you know, vegan uh, proponents, they will, they will cite Ansel Keys, you know, because the main thing they talk about is that cholesterol is bad, meat has cholesterol, red meat has a lot of cholesterol, that, that's why you got to knock these things out. Um, and they, and they'll cite answer keys. Just yeah. jump in there. Can you just explain to everyone a little bit about cholesterol? Um, and we hear a lot that saturated fat, or we previously heard saturated fat was bad, but could you mm. tell us a little bit about the science behind it, why it's not bad? Um, and just, just, just sort of demystify that a little bit for us. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the main thing is, is that it was never bad in the first place. You know, it was, it was, you know, all the studies that suggested that it was bad. We, we now know we have hard evidence that they were bought and paid for by the sugar companies. You know, Ansel Keys did the seven nation study that showed a correlation between, you know, increased cholesterol and heart disease and showed this parabolic curve. So it looked like exponential growth uh, in heart disease uh, for increased cholesterol. Uh, problem is he had complete data for 22 different countries. And he didn't use them. He used the ones that fit his curve. The rest of them are just scattered. Is it, there, so is it, there isn't even a correlation, right? So, you know, all these things will also show a correlation. Maybe they suggested, they concluded that there was a correlation, but obviously they were, you know, they were bullshit. Um, but you can never prove causation from correlation. You, know, you cannot do that. But if you show that there's no correlation between two things, that proves there is no causation, right? Because you have to have correlation before you can get causation, right? So if there's no relationship at all, then obviously there's no causal relationship. Um, so that, that, was, that was a major one. But you know, the Journal of the American Medical Association published in 2015, some of these, these um, internal memos from the sugar companies. And uh, in particular, 
how they paid off three Harvard professors to falsify data and publish fraudulent studies, again, to make it look like cholesterol was causing a problem when it was really sugar. And one of those professors was named head of the USDA. And it was in 1977 that the USDA declared from this guy's paper that he wrote and he published through the USDA that cholesterol caused heart disease, end of discussion. Because this was, this was a hotly debated subject like, since the 50s. You know, I mean, there, there were papers in Journal of American Medical Association, 1956 that I was reading where people were just doing like, I was like, this, this is just ridiculous that people would think this, this is based on really bad evidence, you know, that we should not be, you know, uh, looking at cholesterol as a cause for heart disease uh, based on this. And so this was going all the way up until 1977 when the USDA declared that's it, cholesterol causes heart disease. And, and it just shut down the conversation mm -hmm. and all the doctors and, and clinicians and researchers that were arguing that it was sugar literally got just laughed out of the profession. They, they ruined their reputations and careers. And, and of course they were right. And the, and their opposition actually knew they were right. You know, uh, we actually know what they were paid for. We have documentation. They're paid $6,500, which is about the value it's of like 50, that. It's, it's that detailed. It's that detailed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, no, no. We, we have, we have their contracts, man. Oh, like there's this, like all of it. Like it's, it's like, is this is, this is hard, hard evidence. You know, the only reason this stuff isn't in court is because, you know, statute of limitations is long over, you know, you know how we had like the, you know, the, the cigarette, mm. the tobacco memos yeah. and things like that. Yeah. But oh no, no, there's no evidence that this is addictive or carcinogenic, this and the other. And of course they have reams of, yeah. of data showing exactly that. Well, now we have, you know, the sugar documents. And, and the screwed up thing is like, I was looking at some research the other day. I mean, it was out on like the 8th of August. So like super recent. And it was looking at the correlations and you know, it was looking at the, how different food items were either sustainable or not sustainable. And the comparative, they were comparing the nutritional value of those food items. And if that matched up with it being, if it was less nutritious, then was it less sustainable? And the irony was that they were judging the nutritional um, value of the foods on things like how high in saturated fat it was and yeah. you know and and it's and it's um it's energy density and like and then it was given up and that was given negative scores if it was high in energy and if it was high in saturated fat and it was given positive scores if it was high in vegetables high in rapeseed oil and i can't remember the other thing but oh. they then concluded from there that the more the more nutritious a food the more sustainable it is and that, but the more nutritious foods are plant-based and mm -hmm. the more nutritious foods exclude meat. So like yeah, the whole course. thing that it's this, it's this building of bad research on top of bad research. So it's yeah. very hard to point to, you need to get into the methodological analysis in order to find the issues in this stuff, because it's very hard for people to argue with some of the conclusions. And which is why when people just cite conclusions from papers, like you get a lot of the vegans or the vegetarians or even the meat eaters will just cite a conclusion mm. and without getting into the methodology behind it, it's very difficult for people to see what is going on. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you, yeah, exactly. And that's exactly right. You, you, you can find a study that concludes anything really. And so that, that's not really helpful. You, know, you have to, you do have to go through and look and look in and, and see, you know, do they actually prove that? Do they actually, you know, is the conclusion uh, merited? Mm -hmm. off of that and then you have to you have to hope that people are being honest because you know obviously we have we have tons of of evidence where they were not being honest you know even even like the framingham study which you know i would i learned in medical school this was this was you know really conclusive evidence that cholesterol uh caused heart disease you know follow these guys in framingham massachusetts for like 30 years and uh, and just follow all these different sorts of um markers and they've and um the american heart association you know, published a few years, uh, like two years after the uh, Framingham study finished that, um, that this showed that increased serum cholesterol uh, was correlated with much higher rates of uh, cardiovascular disease. The only problem with that is that the Framingham study actually showed the opposite. Then they actually concluded the opposite. The American Heart Association completely misrepresented the actual findings and conclusions. So there, there are a lot of, you know, influences here. And, uh, and, and that's why you just don't, you just don't trust shit. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, that, that's, the, that's a logical fallacy, you know, um, appealing to authority, you know, just because someone's in charge does not mean that they're correct. Yeah. You know, so the American Heart Association says it's all, well, they would know. I mean, they're the experts. 
Well, no, not necessarily. They could get it wrong. You know, people get things wrong or they could, you could be influenced by other factors. And, and we know that they have been. Um, yeah, but you're, you're right. You know, I mean, when you, when you're looking at things from, you know, based on a false premise, you have to just throw everything out and, you know, but they're still continuing to build stack on, you know, towers on, on top of this, uh, yeah. false premise and they're like oh but we know all this stuff and you know that may have been wrong but all this stuff where well, we know this is right no 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 all that stuff was based on 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 something that you you know is demonstrably false you have to throw it all out and you have to start over again mm-hmm. maybe some of those things will still hold true but you have to start again you have to start over and you know the idea that you know anything that has more calories is bad and anything that has saturated fat and meat is bad. You know, you're, you're, this is a very biased opinion. And, and again, you know, does it really follow that, you know, um, that even if that were true, that that were, would be less sustainable for the environment? Does that really, no, not necessarily. I mean, so that, that's, that again is, is, uh, you know, very tenuous, but the, the whole, the whole sustainability issue is like sustainability is about method, not type you know, like yeah. meat in itself yeah. is not unsustainable, like shoving mm. thousands of cows into like a very dense area and then having all the runoff and stuff. That's probably unsustainable for that area. Mm. The same with plants and monocrop agriculture, like the whole thing just feeds in, feeds into each other. It's about the method. It's not about the demonization of one food. Um, yeah. Well, I was going to say too, you know, there is, um, you know, I was speaking to uh, Dr. Mickey Bendor who did a you know, massive paper showing all the evidence on on why humans are carnivores and have been carnivores for at least the last two million years like like 100 you know like they use the term hyper carnivore so at least 70 percent of their nutrition and, co- and calories coming from meat uh but but realistically it was it was much more than that for for humans uh, because we, we had a higher carnivore rating based on stable isotope uh, research than other carnivores live at the same time like lions hyenas wolves foxes um, and so that means we were eating the lions, hyenas, wolves, and foxes as well, meaning that we were actually top of the food chain. And so if we were eating a lot of plants, that would have actually degraded our, our carnivore rating. And so I, I've really never seen a lion, uh, chew grass, you know, and just, just, you know, you know, mow a lawn for fun. So, you know, they're only eating meat and our carnivore rating is higher than theirs. That means that we're not eating plants. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, he was looking at things as well because he has a background in, in e- e- economy, uh, economics. And so he was looking at this from just an e- economical point of view that you get 10 times the return on energy from, you know, hunting and eating meat than you do from eating plants or even, even, uh, uh, farming, you get 10 times the energy return. So the energy you put out, you get 10 times the return back, uh, by, by hunting. And so he was just like, it's like, that doesn't make any damn sense that we would have, you know, gone into that because it's, it's, you know, nature follows a path of least resistance and that's how, that's how species survive, you know? And so if, if something is, um, you know, is getting just 10 times a return out of something mm-hmm. that that's going to be an evolutionary survival advantage. And so, yeah. Uh, and that's the thing. So we're talking about sustainability. You get ten times the energy return uh, yeah. from animals, and um, and yeah, you're right. You know, when we have monocropping, I mean, this necessarily destroys an entire ecosystem just to grow a single crop. Mm-hmm. You know, animals are part of the ecosystem. It is an ecosystem. It's not just plants. You know, you know, animals are not an invasive. Uh, you know, kingdom onto this earth. We didn't just come from Mars and and just start destroying the place. Uh, You know, everything evolved together. And so if you don't have animal agriculture, you cannot have plant agriculture. Um, Because I mean, think of it just the, 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 the fertilizers, first of all, I mean, all this stuff comes from manures, You you get rid of all the chaff and the hay and all these sorts of things those get sold into feed animals eat that mm. and they turn that fibrous you know fibrous material into meat which is great and they also recycle those nutrients in their feces mm. and uh, this is this is recycling these nutrients they're actually mm. good for the environment they need to get them back out there otherwise they actually burn them so they have like a whole big field of, uh, of just chaff and they have to just burn that down mm. in order to make way for next year's crop and so, you know, that's not really a great thing to do, or they have to throw them in landfills and you're just filling up landfills, which is tons and tons and tons and millions of billions of tons of, of plant material. So yeah. animals are very, very important for all aspects of agriculture. And they also, 
uh, you know, can be run on rangeland and forest land. They don't, you don't need arable land mm. uh, to, you know, to have animals there and the animals going through there, you know, eating down the dead plants and defecating and urinating and even mm. just their hooves digging into the ground that actually changes the water cycle and, and um, increases groundwater. And, and instead of just running off, it yeah. sort of pools and collects and then soaks down. And, and this has been shown conclusively to reverse deserts, you know, people like, uh, Alan Savory are taking, you know, large herds of animals, keep them bunched and moving, mimicking nature and going through an area. And, you know, uh, in, in like, I think in like Patagonia, they, um, they, they had some like sort of deserty areas there and they ran like 20,000 head of sheep through there. And in one year they increased the, the, the vegetation output by 50%. Wow. Just one year. That's just sort of and, compacting the land down so it holds better water and, and then them defecating all over the place and, and more fertilizer and all those different reasons. Yeah. As simple yeah. as that. Yeah. And their, and their hooves were sort of digging and dig little tracks in. So they get the, the footprints, the hoof prints, yeah. instead of just being flat and okay. having the water just run off and, yeah. and, and wash away all the topsoil and, yeah. the, and the seeds and everything like that. It yeah. gets stuck in pools and then sinks down. I yeah. mean, like that, that, that's the thing. There are so many other benefits to a kind of a symbiotic re relationship of plants and animals, not just that. I mean, mm. it, there's, there's so much going on. There's so many different dynamics of, of why meat is being labeled as evil. But I just want to focus back around again on the, on the science. And like, mm -hmm. if you can just explain a little bit more about like what it is in our bodies that saturated fat does, because we're getting unhealthy and we people are following these dietary guidelines and one of the main things is that they cut out saturated fat so what is it what is this this nutrient doing for us so i mean that, that's i guess the fundamental thing is that people think that if you eat fat then you get fat that idea of that you are what you eat okay um and if you eat fat then you'll get fat well i'm made out of meat so i should probably just eat meat then right you know i don't think i'm i don't think i'm a broccoli you know, so I probably should need broccoli if we're going by that ten, uh, sentiment. But, um, you know, the, the main thing is, is that saturated fat and just fat in general does not make you fat. In fact, it can actually um, signal your body to release your fat stores because you're saying, hey, we have food, we have food coming in, we have an abundance of nutrient nutrients. And so we don't, we don't need to lock this in like we're, we're starving. You actually find that when people eat less calories, uh, their basal metabolic rate goes down significantly. You know, you will, you will stop using as much energy. So people think, oh, it's calories in, calories out. No, it's really not that simple. You know, if you eat less calories, you will burn less calories as well, um, metabolically. And so in fact, eating more of these things will actually increase your metabolism, even just being on a ketogenic, uh, and it's ketogenic metabolism, you'll increase your basal metabolic rate on average by 300 kilocalories a day. So, you know, it, it really matters what you eat. Um, saturated fat, you know, are, is, is, you know, what makes the animal kingdom go around, you know, carnivores and herbivores, basically all animals uh, will run on saturated fat carnivores because they eat animals with fat and they go for the fat first, but also herbivores that eat fibrous plants, because that's actually uh, what they're getting their nutrition from. They, the bacteria in their guts break down uh, fiber and into short chain fatty acids as a waste product. And then animal absorbs those short chain fatty acids and then the bacteria die off and the, the animal absorbs them as protein. So even gorillas that just eat green leaves, they get about 70% of their calories from saturated fat and cows get around 80% because you know, they're, they're breaking down this, this fiber into that. So they're, they're all in this ketogenic starvation state, you know, it's not, they don't run on carbohydrates, you know, the animal kingdom runs on fat. Uh, our body's made out of fat. Our body's made out of cholesterol. Uh, every cell in your body is made out of cholesterol. The cell membranes in your body are cholesterol. Your bile is made out of cholesterol. Every, all of your hormones are made out of cholesterol, testosterone, uh, estrogens, uh, progestogens, uh, your mineral corticoids, glucocorticoids, you know, things like cortisol, all these things that come out of your adrenals. All of those are are made from cholesterol as a very, very important molecule um, to the point that we make it right? But we don't make enough of it. We need, we need some in our, in our uh, diet as well. Uh, our brain is made out of saturated fat. Our nervous tissue, it's white for a reason. That's fat lining our, our, um, our uh, myelin sheath that goes around uh, our axons. It's sort of like insulation on a, on a wire and that helps conduct 
those uh, and propagate that signal down your, your uh, neuron, that's all fat. So your brain needs cholesterol. It needs saturated fat. And specifically, it needs very long chain fatty acids, 20 and 22 chain fatty acids. These things don't exist in plants or, or fungus. And so we, and we don't really make it very well. So we have to get it from our, our dietary source. You know, we were talking sort of before this talking about like, you know, if you don't get enough sleep, you know, on average, if you get less than six hours of sleep, um, you're six times more likely to get, uh, Alzheimer's. Well, the same is true of not getting enough saturated fat and actually having low cholesterol. There are studies showing that people with higher LDL cholesterol and saturated fat intake are protected against Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and other forms of dementia. And even, um, you know, pregnant women who eat more saturated fat and have higher LDL cholesterol, they have lower rates of children with autism, you know? So this is very important for our brains and we we've been limiting this. And in fact, excluding this from our diet for, you know, the better part of, of 50 years now. And, and what has happened, Alzheimer's rates have gone up, Parkinson's dementia, even autism, they've all gone up uh, very, very rapidly. Uh, there are other causes of this, but this is certainly going to be a contributing factor. Mm -hmm. And when everyone's put on a, a, you know, a low fat heart, healthy diet, you know, so-called heart, healthy mm -hmm. diet. Now, all of a sudden, everyone's going to nursing homes. Everyone's getting dementia. Everyone's getting Alzheimer's. You know, I, I learned, you know, when I was in medical school, you know, one of the professors was like, oh yeah, you know, if you live long enough, everyone will get Alzheimer's. Why the hell is that the case? You know, animals in the wild don't get Alzheimer's. Animals in the zoo don't get Alzheimer's. They die of old age in the zoo. You, know, you could argue that in the wild, well, then maybe just once they're slowing down, they get picked off. Sure. But not in the zoo. Mm. You know, when, when a zebra starts acting goofy, they don't just like let the lions on them. You know, like, <laughs> I think you see that. That'd be well, yeah, it might, <laughs> might bring more people to the zoo. But, um, you know, but, but that's the thing, you know, we, we don't see these things. You know, we don't see cancer in animals in the wild. We don't see cancer in animals in the zoo when they're fed their natural diet. Mm. And so, but dogs and cats, they get cancer. They get all, they get, they get all sorts of uh, diseases like autoimmune disease, even heart disease and liver disease and all these things when eating kibble and nonsense, you know, they're carnivores. You know, we know this, but we, we give them grain and plant-based nonsense and they, and they get the same illnesses that we do. And this is why there are signs at the zoo and even at parks saying, don't feed the animals. You know, this is not what they eat. They get sick. If you feed them this, well, we should have those signs in front of our refrigerators as well. You know, don't eat this crap. And, um, but yeah, no, saturated fat is, is absolutely vital, mm. uh, to our health. I mean, think about, think of the Inuits, you know, um, you know, living up North, they just eat blubber, you know, <laughs> like yeah. you know, whale blubber, <laughs> seal blubber, you know, they're just eating tons of fat and, you know, and they're very, very healthy. They just mm. have not had the same diseases that we've gotten. These used to be called the diseases of the West. Now it's just called normal. Yeah. and aging, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, but no, it is very, they're very abnormal. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are studies that look at this in the Inuit population and the ones that are better designed and actually look at, at the people who are living naturally and just eating, uh, you know, blubber and things like that. They don't have any of these diseases. They don't get heart disease. They don't get cancer. They don't get any of this. Like literally there, there's studies specifically looking at this in certain areas in Canada, and they just found, it was just like, they, they, they could not find a single case of cancer mm. in these populations. And, and do, do you think, I'll just get a little bit of your opinion on that. Is, is you would put that down to specifically just the saturated fat, or is that also because they're away from things like chemical toxins and like other aspects in society? I mean, like what, is, is this all saturated fat causing our, nearly all of our issues now? Or is that, do you think there's other stuff at play? No. So, I mean, well, it's going to be multifactorial, but, you know, but, but um, what I'm saying is, is that saturated fat certainly isn't contributing to that, you know, because they're eating a ton of saturated mm. fat and they're not getting cancer. But then you look at, you look at when there are studies that, you know, people will like to cite to, to try to throw shade on this and they'll say, oh, well, look, and you have these studies that show that these, that they will get heart disease and cancer and all these sorts of things. Those are the ones that don't discriminate between the the ethnic population of Inuit um and uh and 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 the diet that they're that they're living on so mm -hmm. so I have someone who is who is an a, you know a native uh, you know Alaskan or a native Canadian and they're living in a city and they're eating you know Western food and they're getting the Western diseases. Well duh that was mm -hmm. that was the entire premise. And <laughs> um you know but the ones that 
that differentiate that and say like, no, these guys are just living naturally and they're just, they're just, you know, doing their, their traditional ways, you know, they don't get that. And so it's certainly going to be an exposure. Yeah. I mean, you know, pollution and all these sorts of things and whatever, you know, I mean, there's, there's going to be a ton of different factors, but a major, major, major one is the food that we eat. And, you know, like I was saying with just the plants, they're having hundreds you know, dozens, if not hundreds of carcinogens in them. Mm-hmm. Obviously that's not great. Um, eating a bunch of carbohydrates um, is, is also damaging as well. We know that, um, that when you're on a ketogenic diet, when you're just not eating carbohydrates, even if you're eating a bunch of you know, poison plants, you're just not eating carb, your mitochondria work better. They, they respirate four times as efficiently. So you're making energy four times as efficiently, and you generally have four times as many, uh, mitochondria. We know since the 1930s, uh, from the work of uh, Nobel prize winner, Otto Warburg, that if you have healthy functioning mitochondria, you cannot get cancer. And that's been um, reiterated and, and, and reproven by uh, people such as, you know, Professor Thomas Seafried of Boston College, uh, who have shown, and, and he wrote a book called Cancer is a Metabolic Disease, you know, showing wow. that, you know, cancer comes from dysfunctional mitochondria that can't, you know, go through aerobic um, uh, respiration anymore. And they have to switch back over to anaerobic and fermentation. Mm. And this causes a lot of problems. It sh- kicks off a bunch of free radicals that change your DNA. But also the main thing is that your mitochondria are the sort of the, the main thing that inhibit un- unregulated growth, which is what cancer is. It's just, it's just growth out of control, right? It's the mitochondria that do that. And he actually showed that if you take the nucleus from a cancer cell that has all this, these genetic cancer changes, and you put that into a normal cell with normal mitochondria, it doesn't behave as cancer because it's inhibited by, by the mitochondria. Mm. But when you take the mitochondria, the damaged mitochondria out of the cancer cell, and you put that into a, a normal cell with normal DNA, it does behave as cancer. So even without the genetic changes, it still behaves as cancer. And this is why you see in tumors, you'll see that there's certainly going to be these, these cells that, I mean, just visibly look different and, um, and you can check their genetics and they'll have different, you know, genetic hallmarks and and traits, but that's not every single cell in the tumor. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of these tumors have normal DNA, but they are behaving in the same way as all the other cancer cells. And that's because they all have dysfunctional mitochondria. And so, uh, that was one of the things that, um, you know, I, I, again, I learned in, in cancer biology, plants have carcinogens. I, I spoke with professor Seafried about it and he, and he, uh, I mentioned, he just said, and, and you know what all those carcinogens do, they all damage your mitochondria, um, from the plants. So there's going to be a lot of things, uh, that they're going to be contributing to cancer, but this is certainly a major one, uh, is, is the food that we eat because it's going to change our metabolism, both in a macroscopic and microscopic level, even to the, to the cellular level. And, and, I mean, I would suggest at this point, any, any vegan or vegetarian cover their ears if they haven't already. Um, <laughs> but, but like you would naturally think then for, if you follow that on to its natural conclusion that those people who are following a vegetarian or a vegan diet are more likely to acquire cancer or more likely to acquire these, these metabolic diseases. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, and you do, and you do find that. And you, you also find that there's a, there's a higher incidence of, of other sorts of issues. So much higher rate of, um, of uh, miscarriage in uh, vegan and vegetarians, much higher rates of uh, children with autism. And that's not a, a correlation. There's actually cause, causative studies shown by uh, the University of Texas A&M actually showed that um, a deficiency in carnitine would cause a specific kind of autism. Autism, what is autism? Autism is a misdevelopment of our neurons and uh, so that they don't, they don't work properly. And they can be, you, that can be from a number of causes and that can and cause a misdevelopment of different parts of the brain that will manifest as different kinds of, of syndromes or autisms, you know, it's autism spectrum disorder. That means a spectrum of causes, really. Um, one of them is from lack of carnitine. Most people make carnitine, um, but not everyone does. And not everyone makes enough. Carnitine is a very, very important mo- uh, uh, amino acid and it's very vital for the proper uh, development of our neurons. And so when you don't have enough carnitine, these neurons will not form properly. They won't work properly. They won't make proper connections. And so the brain won't develop to its, its potential. And if 
you're eating just even just an omnivorous diet, including meat, you, you should be okay because basically all animal products have carnitine in them, but they do not exist in plants or fungus. And so if you're not eating any meat, you're not getting any exogenous car, uh, carnitine. And so if you're, if you're not making enough, you will get this kind of autism. And so it's, it's only in the genetically susceptible, you know, because not everyone will uh, not make enough carnitine, but in those populations, now we're seeing this, this rise in, in, uh, autism, you know, and, you know, a lot of, and there's a ton of carnitine in red meat. That's the most abundant source of carnitine is red meat. And of course, what's, what's the first thing that vegetarians drop when they're stopping eating meat, they, they drop mm -hmm. the red meat because that's the worst, right? Well, no, actually it's the best. And, um, and that's just one of the reasons. And so even if their kid, you know, is getting some chicken or fish or, or some milk or whatever, and they're, but they're very, very bad at making carnitine, they'll still be deficient you know, whereas if they were eating red meat, they'd never have a problem. And then of course the vegans, they don't, they don't have any of it at all. You know, even if they're, if they're making just, just barely not enough, they'll still get this kind of autism mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of the biggest issues I have with or one of, one of my biggest struggles as a coach is trying to get my clients who think they're doing the healthiest thing. And sorry, I have a Mexican uh, truck driving past outside the sort of mar mariachi music on. Um, nice. But like, it's one of the hardest things to get, to get across some of my clients that the best bang for their buck in terms of upping their nutrition and getting more nutrition, more, getting more value from their diet is to go and eat a steak because they, it's been absolutely drilled into them that a steak is the worst thing they can eat and they should save it as a treat for like once a month or once a week or once every other week. I mean, if I could get someone to eat it once a week, I'd be, it would be a real victory. But, you know, and, and it's almost this, it's this bargaining, like a lot of people would try and bargain, like, but I can, I can sort of, I can have fish, can't I? Or I can have chicken, can't I? Or I can get all my proteins from plants. And there is this whole, no. there, there's this, there's this whole, you know, uh, dogma out there that you can get all of your protein from plants. And I mean, could you maybe just dispel a few myths about, the, the nine essential amino acids and the amino acids we get from plants. And, and I mean, you've talked a little about the toxins, um, but maybe a little bit about the proteins. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, when we define these things as, as essential proteins and non-essential proteins, you know, you, you can get a complete set of uh, essential proteins from, from plants and you know, a combination of a lot of different plants in theory, but, you know, like we're talking about with, with carnitine, Carnitine is, a, is an essential amino acid for some people, you know, so that, that will not get that. <clears throat> and there, and there are others as well that, that sort of fit that example that, you know, we do technically make, but, you know, just like cholesterol, we don't necessarily make enough and, uh, and some people may not, you know, make much at all. And so, you know, it is very different. Um, you know, I just, just to hop back very quickly, there are different kinds of vegans, obviously, you know, there's, you know, Oreo cookies are vegan, right? Heroin is vegan. So you can have someone just, you know, just, you know, drinking Coke, eating Oreo cookies and, and shooting heroin, totally vegan. Decent you know, obviously he's going to have a very different health outcome than someone who's eating whole foods and, and eliminating out sugars and other sorts of as much noxious sort of uh, chemicals as possible. They're going to have a very different health profile. And so, you know, you can actually have improvements um, even coming, you know, coming from a standard Western diet on that, you know, but, but eventually you'll run out because you cannot even get basic nutrition from, from the plant and fungus kingdom. You, you cannot, I mean, there are things that exist in meat that you can only get from meat that you have to have. And so eventually you, you'll run out. The, the opposite is not true. You know, there's nothing in plants or fungus that you have to have that you cannot get from meat. Um, but that, that, that goes into RDAs and things like that as well, because on paper, it does look like that's the case, but in fact, it's not, we could go into that if you want, but as far as, as far as the protein is concerned, first of all, you know, you're not, not everyone will be able to get all of the essential amino acids from plants. Um, but let's say that you can, the major thing is the bioavailability, you know, you're not going to absorb or take in 
uh, all of the protein, the so-called protein that's in plants. It's just not available to us. We can't break it down properly. We're not designed to break it down and absorb it properly. Some of this stuff is not, you know, uh, you know, meant to be uh, broken down, absorbed. When you look at gluten, gluten is a protein in wheat. It makes up 80% of the protein content in wheat. It is completely unavailable to us. We cannot break it down. We cannot use it as protein at all. And it actually causes a lot of harm. Obviously, you know, uh, you know, celiac patients, uh, will have a, a serious problem, but it also screws with other, everyone else and cause leaky gut, which is a breakdown of the, of the, the actual barriers between, uh, the enterocytes. So the cells in your intestinal lining. And so things can physically traverse into your, into your bloodstream that are, would never be able to get in otherwise, uh, even bacteria and things like that. And so you can get uh, quite, quite sick from this. This is, this is actually a, a mechanism for autoimmune issues because lectins and other sort of poisons from plants will get into your body and your body will attack those with antibodies. And then people that are genetically susceptible have similar areas, um, you know, similar enough mm. that those antibodies will work on those areas and your body will attack itself. But then you eliminate those lectins, you take those away, your body stops making antibodies towards those lectins and there's no more spillover and autoimmune issues just go away. And we've actually known this in the uh, medical literature since the 1800s that you put someone on a pure red meat and water diet, um, rheumatoid arthritis goes away. Crohn's goes away. Ulcerative colitis goes away. All these things go away. And I, you know, I, I, I see people all the time with this, you know, just, just completely reversing their autoimmune issues very quickly. Um, and then, you know, so all the harm aside, you're, you're still not getting the, the protein. There's also a, a way that people uh, you know, sort of screw with numbers as well is that they, there's a difference between, there's something, something called crude protein, um, and, and an actual available protein crude protein is just measuring the amount of nitrogen that exists in a substance. And then they just assume that all those nitrogen molecules are part of an amino acid, but that's not actually the case. There's a ton of, of non-protein nitrogen that exists in plants, but they're counting all of that as protein. And so you have, you say, oh, 30 grams of pea protein. Probably not, you know, it's probably a lot of that is just, you know, just, you know, nitrogen in some other form. And then you have the bioavailability problem. There's some of these things that just aren't available. Maybe they just, you can only break it down slightly, but then there's another factor, which another one of these, there's a lot of different ways that plants screw with you to stop you from eating them, right? One of them is disrupting your digestion, your, your avail ab ability to absorb nutrients. And so they have things called like protease inhibitors. Prote um, protease is something that breaks down protein, ASE and, you know, ACE, that's something that breaks something down. So protease is something that breaks down protein and that gets released from your pancreas, goes into your gut and this helps break down protein. So you can, you can take in the amino acids. Um, there are plants make protease inhibitors, you know, very commonly in like soy and wheat, they have very strong protease inhibitors. So even if you're just eating like a sandwich with like wheat bread, you're going to get protease inhibitors, even if it has meat, even, and, and they, meat is absolutely bioavailable. If you just eat meat on its own, you will absorb 98% of it, you know, just, just right off the bat but now you're eating it in a sandwich form and you get these protease inhibitors. Now you're not going to absorb as much of that. Your body's not going to be able to take that in, even though it would normally be bioavailable. So those, those are just some of the, of the sort of the, the, you know, big reasons why it's not as, as straightforward as is on yeah. a surface. You get a, you know, thing of pre pea protein says you're getting 30 grams of protein that is not going to translate to actual usable protein. Wow. I did not know that. I did not know that. I knew there was a different, I knew there was an, an element of bioavailability of nutrients, but I didn't know it was, it was as pretty much cut and dry as that crude protein <laughs> and available protein. I mean, I, I just anecdotally feel 100% better when I'm eating less. I mean, everyone talks about eating the rainbow and eating, you know, this wide variety and a balance of, of fruits and vegetables and meats and a little bit of meat and fish. I feel 100% better when I limit the amount of things I'm eating, just just pure, like pure, pure range of different items. And whenever I have sometimes I have a guilty pleasure. I mean, I, I'm not very good with cheese, and I'm not very good with, you know, lactose and, um, and wheat, and you know, and like you're saying for gluten and everything. And whenever I have, I love pizza, you know, but whenever I have it, I'm like, I regret it. I'm like, the next day, yeah. it's like a hangover. It's like a huge hangover. I feel yeah. terrible. 
And then, you know, that stops me eating it for another two or three weeks. But, you know, there's, it definitely feels like damage is being done. And the less I eat it, the more sensitive my body becomes to it. It's like, you know, an invader's coming in. Um, so, I mean, if, if people are getting the idea, like, that they want to start carnivore, all of this is a bit of a revelation to them. Like, what should they expect in the first week of carnivore? Like, how do they go about it? Are they allowed to? I mean, Paul Saladino eats fruit. He's just sort of one of the big voices in there. So, like, what should they avoid? How should they do it? Um, first couple of weeks. Yeah. Well, I'd certainly avoid fruit. Uh, I definitely do that. Um, you know, uh, you know, my my hard rule. You know, it, I, I talk about a lot of things in in as much as what not to eat as what what to eat. And, uh, and you're right, you're eliminating out a lot of things and you're feeling better when you do. Um, you know, there's a good reason for that. You know, animals in, in nature eat a very monotonous diet. You know, cows eat grass. You know, they're not getting a bunch of variety. You know, uh, lions aren't really getting a bunch of variety. They're eating gazelle, they're eating animals. And, um, and that's because that's, that's their, their primary nutrition source. And so they, they enjoy that. They're getting all these nutrients and they, and they are rewarded with positive feedback from taste. Um, so my hard rule when I look at, at things to eliminate, you know, it's not just eating meat and eating fatty meat. That's definitely part of it. That's where you get your nutrition, but it's as much to do with what not to eat as what to eat. So my hard rule is no plants, no sugar, nothing artificial. And that goes for sauces, seasonings, and drinks as well. And so fruit certainly hits two of those, the plant and the sugar. And, you know, uh, you know, Dr. Saladino, um, you know, I, I, and I agree with so much of what he talks about, but I just, you know, I just respectfully disagree with him on this one. Um, sugar is sugar is sugar. Like it's like fructose has been shown very conclusively, uh, with hard biochemical evidence. It's not like a, you know, we got a study that concluded, no, no, this is, this is actual hard biochemistry. The, the biochemistry department at university of California, San Francisco, um, which is a top 10 medical research institution in the world showed biochemically what fructose does in the body and how it's broken down and the pathways it gets broken down and the things it gets broken down into. And they found that it actually gets broken down into the exact same byproducts as ethanol. So we get the same damage to our body from eating fructose as we do from ethanol, get fatty liver disease, cirrhosis, diabetes, heart disease, even implicating cancer and Alzheimer's. So this is, this is bad stuff you know, and it's highly addictive and, you know, it gives a, a dopamine response to the addiction centers of your brain, just like cocaine, heroin, and meth and kills the same areas of your brain as meth to the same extent as meth. This is, is we, we've proven this on MRI studies. This is a drug. This is a, this should be a controlled substance, you know? And so, you know, this is, this is addictive and, and destroying parts of our brain, just like methamphetamines do. I'm not doing everything that methamphetamines do, but it does kill those, those addiction areas of the brain. And it also is destroying the body like alcohol. So this is a devastating chemical. You know, Paul argues that, well, in, in, as he calls it in the matrix of fruit and honey, that it's actually, that actually fructose is okay. And there's literally zero evidence to suggest that, you know, it was like, why would it be different? It's, it's, it's the same chemical, you know, it's just like, you know, it's just like, it is, is, you know, cocaine in the in the matrix of the coca leaf is that is that okay for you you know it was like sounds like he not. sounds like he he's he's addicted and he's justifying the action <laughs> yeah i mean that's that's certainly that certainly could be uh the case you know but yeah. you know whatever way he's, he's sort of convinced himself and unfortunately he's convinced a lot of others that this is okay to do and i've, I've sort of picked up the pieces from this going back the last couple of years because you know i've i've, I've spoken out against this i'm like look this is this is one of the like the, the most, you know, the, the hardest pieces of evidence we have in, in nutritional biochemistry. And, um, you know, I, I did not think this was even like something that people were debating anymore. Mm -hmm. And, and I argued, you know, why that was and why I thought people should avoid it. And I had a lot of people come up, you know, uh, message me and get a hold of me. Um, you know, before I had any sort of online presence, I was just on, you know, like Dr. Sean Baker's podcast on the people's podcast. It would just have me on and, uh, would talk about these things. And people would contact me and just be like, you know, like, actually that, that is like, you know, because these things are addictive too. You know, maybe, maybe you can have a bit of fruit and a bit of honey, but you could have a bit of cocaine and a bit of alcohol too. And it wouldn't be as bad as if you were doing it every day. The problem is that these addictive substances become an everyday mm -hmm. thing if you don't uh, watch out. And, and that's exactly what was happening to these people. A lot of these people come to the carnivore diet because they have serious food addiction problems. They have serious 
a seriously unhealthy relationship with food. And all of a sudden they start mixing back in this addictive substance. And all of a sudden, you know, within, you know, three, four months, they're back eating, you know, pizza and ice cream and, and drinking Coke on the mm -hmm. couch and not doing anything. They've gained all the weight back and they, and they're very unhealthy again. And I had a lot of people come up to me and say that, you know, you know, uh, Paul works out a lot, you know, he goes surfing for three hours a day, every day, you know, work, you know, does all uh, other stuff. I'm sure, uh, you know, I, I've played professional sports, eating carbohydrates and eating other sorts of things. And I was ripped because I worked my ass off, you know, but that doesn't mean that it was as easy or it, that doesn't mean it was good for me. I was still, it was way easier to get ripped on a carnivore diet. I can tell you that if any, you stay ripped, you know, I don't even have to work out that often. I, 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 I don't change how I look. I don't change my body fat percentage. So that would be my main thing is, is, is don't get sidetracked by, by things like that. Um, and just keep it simple. You know, you just eat meat, you just drink water and that's it. You know, you don't have to, you don't, you don't have to, you know, confuse the issue. You want to eat fat and that will be really, and that, and that's, you'll feel a lot better for that in the first two weeks, you'll get most of the crap out of your system and you will, you will feel radically different. You know, like I did, I lost, you know, 10 kilos in 10 days and, you know, and then I, I stayed basically the same weight. And, but my body just started transforming after that. And I started just shredding fat and stacking on muscle. And so that's, that's generally what you'll see is that people will, you know, lose a, a big chunk of weight early on because they're getting off, getting out the water weight and a lot of inflammation. And then after about two weeks, they'll just feel amazing. Mm. You know, your body will just start feeling better than it ever has. And you'll just start, you know, hitting, hitting your stride and in, in how you feel physically. And then your body, especially if you're working out, will just start uh, changing in front of you and you'll just get healthier and healthier and feel better and better. Some people have some difficulty with weight loss. I think it's about 1%, you know, just, just rough estimate on people. Some people actually even gain a little bit of weight. Mm. There can be some reasons for this. You know, we're talking about, you know, metabolism when you're eating less and you're starving yourself, your body goes into a starvation panic mode and it just says, Hey, we need to sequester these nutrients. It can take time to undo that and undo that damage, especially if you've been doing, you know, dieting and starving yourself and eating, you know, abject, you know, low, low, uh, nutrient poison your whole life. You know, your body's may take some, take some convincing, uh, to realize that, Hey, we're not in a famine anymore. We can actually start using some of this stuff and increasing your basal metabolic rate. So that happens, but you know, I have yet to see people, you know, not overcome that after, you know, sometimes it takes six months, a year. I mean, there was one that lady was sort of two years, um, but eventually it does happen mm. and, uh, and your body will, will overcome that. Most people will lose weight pretty quickly though. And, and just to, just to, dif just to make distinction, when you say meat, what are we putting in that category there? I mean, is that fish as well? Chicken and like, yeah. you know, or is it just red meat? Yeah. Anything that moves and had a face you know, is pretty good. Okay. Okay, that's yeah. pretty. Simple. And then I say that because yeah, you know some shellfish. Some people have like shellfish uh, allergies and things yeah. like that. But if you, if you you know, but you can go for those too. Yeah. So yeah, any animal is fine. You know, any animal meat is fine. So yeah, I don't, um, I don't uh, uh, just just think you have to eat red meat. Uh, although you know it seems to be uh, one of the more nutritious uh, sources. Just ruminant animals. They they just they're better able at getting more nutrients out of the out of the plant. And they also are better able uh, to, to eliminate out uh, the different toxins and things like that. And so you just get, you just get very, very healthy uh, meat. Uh, I definitely feel the best on red meat. I predominantly only eat uh, cow, basically like 99% of what I eat is cow. And then maybe I'll have some pork bellies or something like that, or lamb chops, uh, maybe some eggs every now and then. And that's, that's mostly it. Every now and then I'll see like a salmon or something like that. I mean, like, oh, that looks good. And I'll just grab that. But, you know, mostly it's beef. And, and you're being guided by hunger. You're not trying to hit a certain amount of intake or just purely hunger. Yeah, that's it. I, I've literally never, ever tracked my calories in or out. I mean, mm -hmm. out, you're never going to track properly without sophisticated equipment. Uh, but in, I just couldn't care less. Yeah. You know, you think about this. If, if, we're, if we're going to be doing... If we're, if we're going to be eating properly, I, I think it would follow that you would be eating what we evolved on, what we're biologically uh, adapted to eat. If we're biologically adapted to eat it, then it should come naturally. 
right? Nature is natural. It just happens on its own. You know, cows don't have a calculator out figuring out exactly how many, you know, kilos of grass they need to eat that day and what their macro outs are and all that sort of nonsense. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't have, uh, you know, people, you know, telling them to track this and that and like, oh, eat this thing and eat that. You know, they just eat what tastes good and they eat as much as they care to, you know? And so that's how I, I sort of gauge it is just by if it tastes good, because your tastes will change depending on how much your body wants those nutrients. And so I, I talked to some people as well that are, you know, trying to lose a lot of weight and they go on a carnivore diet and they're very used to having very big portions. And I tell them you can eat as much, you just eat as much as you want. And then you just stop when you, when you're done. And I I've had to sort of change how I, how I explain that to people because sometimes they were just saying, okay, well, this, I want to make this big plate of food. And then they sort of eat half of that or even a quarter of that. And then their body's telling them, slow it down, you know, and uh, we don't need this much because they're actually, your body's trying to use primarily it's, it's stored fat. And so then they end up force feeding themselves and ask me like, how's it going? You know, they're like, oh, I hate it. I hate this carnivore diet. <laughs> it was like, okay, you know, why? So, so I would just hate, it. I just hate the taste of meat. I hate this and the other, just horrible. So I asked him, I was like, okay, you know, does it always taste bad? Like when you first start a meal, does it taste bad then? And they're like, you know, well, well, no, I mean, it tastes, you know, usually tastes really good, but then like you know, I get part way in and then it just tastes horrible. And I have to spend two hours just forcing myself to feed, to eat this. And I was like, mm. well, that's, that's your body telling you to stop. You know, your body's saying that you know, we've had enough and you can just stop. So you just, just do that intuitively. So I, I generally make more meat than I think I'm going to want. And, and I, I get to that point where I get to the point where I'm just like, Ugh, I'm just not really enjoying this anymore. And I just naturally stop and I just keep those for leftovers the next day. Yeah. And, and you find it, it's very interesting, right? You have, you have the same piece of meat that you made at the same time in the same conditions. And at first when you're eating it, it's the best damn thing you've ever eaten. And then you, as you're eating, it's like the best damn thing, best damn thing. It's good. It's really good. It's really good. It's okay. It's all right. And you get to a point, you're like, ugh, I just don't like this. You know, it's the same piece of meat. Why the hell does it taste different? It's to say it should give the same chemical response, right? No, it's, it's a lot more sophisticated than that. Mm. You know, you're, you're getting these signals in saying, hey, these are these nutrients coming in. Your brain's tracking these things. And it just says, nope, 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 we've got enough. You will never be able to track your nutrients better than your, your brain and your biochemistry can. It is not possible. And so you might as well just, just let, it, let it do its thing. That's super interesting. I think we've just gone over an hour there and like, I just want to have one last question. And yeah, sure. that question is, what about coffee and tea? Yeah, they're plants. <laughs> yeah. I thought you so were going to say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for me, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't use those. Um, and you know, I, I find I feel much better without them. You know, even even though I, you know uh, we were talking before, um, you know, off camera that you know like just the stupid hours that I work, mm. you know, like thirty six hour shifts, Crazy. sometimes sixty hour shifts. Um, I don't drink coffee, you know, and, and sometimes I, I've, I've a couple of times I've taken like a caffeine tablet because, you know, if I want the caffeine, why don't I just take the caffeine, right? There's 150,000 chemicals in coffee besides caffeine. I don't want those, you know, I, I, I want the caffeine, right? And so, you know, you eliminate out all those other things and then you just get the caffeine. Well, when I do that, and I've only done that maybe three times in the last two years, I've seriously regretted it. The first four hours or something like that. I feel great. You know? And I was like, okay, yeah, I'm got all this energy and everything's good. And then when I crash, it just, I crash so bad. And I just, and I just hate my life. And the rest of the day is just miserable. I guess I could just keep, you know, feeding the beast and like taking more and more of the mm -hmm. stuff, but like, it really just makes me feel gross. And so I just actually just don't want to, don't want anything to do with it. One of the things with, with coffee in particular, you should look at it again, going back to taste. Um, if something is bitter and it tastes bad, you know, that means there is something in there that is bad for you by definition, you know, our, our brain and our tongue are sophisticated machines and they can identify chemicals that are harmful to us for ingestion. And that's what bad taste is. You know, this is why kids will spit out vegetables because they, they know damn well that stuff is poison, you know? And, um, and so that bitter taste is something in there that's bad for you. That's, that's a, like, it's just a natural Mr. Yuck sticker, like, bah, spit it out. You know, you just been like, oh, God, no, bah, you know, and you're just going to spit it out in nature and you're natural and you're, and you're not going to 
be so sharp, you'll cut yourself and overthink things like, oh no, that, that bitter taste is okay. And these, and you can convince yourself of all sorts of things. Nature, if you see this and like, oh, bitter, oh, no, I'm not gonna eat that. Um, coffee is very bitter, obviously. That's because there are things in there that, that cause harm. I just ran an experiment on myself when I was, when I was just getting back into this and, and I hadn't eaten anything in, in weeks and I was, was not getting sore. I couldn't get sore from working out. And I put it to the test. I did end up doing 32 sets of heavy legs to just try to wear my legs out and try to get sore. And I couldn't do it. And I ended up stopping at 32 sets because I'd just been there for four hours and I had shit to do. And I was like, okay, I just have to stop this. And like the next day I wasn't sore. And I was like, okay, let's go hiking. I went hiking up a mountain, went to rugby practice that night. And that was when I said, I was like, yeah, all right, I'm ready to go back to rugby. You know, I feel great. I didn't look great. I looked, I was, you know, I was, you know, fat and out of shape, but I felt amazing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I went back and I was a dead sprint, you know, keeping up with them. I hadn't run in a year. I'd been doing humanitarian work in refugee camps in Bangladesh for like months before that. And while all these guys were training their asses off and I was, I was able to keep up with everyone and I, and I felt great doing it. Next day, I still wasn't sore. The day after that, you know, two days after you're supposed to be really bad. I still wasn't sore. I could feel like, like, yeah, okay. You know, I did some work. My body's talking to me. It's like, but I could still do it. I could do it again. I wasn't stiff. I wasn't sore. sore. It wasn't uncomfortable. And I met a friend uh, at a coffee shop and I was like, all right, well, I haven't had coffee in a while. You know, let, let's see what this does. Let's see if I can have coffee in my, in my diet. One cup of black coffee within 20 minutes, my hammies were like tight and sore and stiff. Wow. My back was getting sore. And I was, I, I was literally feeling it in real time. Like going, Oh, what's happening. What's happening. That's and crazy. I was sore for two damn days after that, you know? And so it's just like, so there's, there's clearly something in there. Mm. That's not, that's not agreeing with me and causing this inflammation, pain, stiffness uh, and soreness. And, um, and so that's just not, not for me, you know, I, I like feeling my best and I certainly don't like feeling sore after I work out. And so, uh, that's, that's why I avoid it. Mm. And, that, and that's the thing though, that plants make these things in order to get that response and make you feel like shit so that you don't eat them. Mm. It's just like, Hey, don't eat me. Like that, that's the plants way of telling you to back off, you know, but we've been eating this stuff. We've been literally force feeding children, this stuff for generations now. And so you just always grow up being sore and being stiff and feeling just low grade, horrible. And so you, you're not getting those feedback in any meaningful way, but now I'm outside of it and I eat that stuff and I'm like, Oh God, no, that makes me feel horrible. Mm -hmm. I have, I have a complete aversion to this stuff. And so, um, that's, that's, you know, that's in keeping with nature, but that, that's also why I do it. I, I, I really don't want this stuff. And people say, Oh, don't you miss this? I'm like, no, no, I don't I have no interest. Well, that's, it, that's crazy. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to run a few little experiments now. Yeah. Um, but Anthony, thank you so much for joining me. I'm sure you sparked a lot of interest in a lot of people who are listening. Um, so where can they find you? Where can they hear more about your work? Uh, yeah, well, thank you. I hope, I hope people did. I hope people, uh, you know, found that useful. Um, I have a YouTube channel. It's just called Anthony Chafee MD. And, um, I have a lot of videos on there and, and you're talking about these things, bioavailability, uh, there's, there's one called plants are trying to kill you. And it just goes into a lot of the details about that. And, um, you know, or, you know, and, and a lot of other things as well, you know, interview with professor Seafried on cancer and, and all sorts of different things. Um, and then I'm on Instagram as well, Anthony Chafee MD, and I post a lot of stuff there and I have a, um, a podcast called the plant free MD, as you would expect, because I don't like plants and, um, and uh, so it's on like Spotify and, and Apple and everything else. And, um, and then I'm just, I've just started a, a Patreon group as well. And I put out extra content there and early release videos and um, like weekly zoom meetings as well, um, as well as doing um, like coaching groups and things like that. And 30 day challenges um, that people can find on uh, just uh, how to carnivore.com. You can sign up for that. And those are the main things. Yeah. And if people want to, sort of get extra support. I, you know, I try, I try to do that. I do have, um, you know, my, my work in neurosurgery, which is very busy, but I, I do try to schedule, uh, times to like help people as well and, and do sort of zoom calls. Um, if, if, if people really need it, but, um, I try to, I try to get everything I can in my videos, uh, so that people can just get all this stuff for free. Epic. Epic. Thank you so much, Anthony. I mean, I don't know how you do it all, but uh, I'm looking forward to seeing more in the future. And uh, thanks everyone for listening. No, no problem. Thank you very much for having me.